to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch buck? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, Brian Barney here. Another episode of the podcast coming at you. Um, episode 12. So, um, crazy. I know I'd, I'd say the episode number every time, but, uh, it's just, uh, it's wild. What a great platform and haven't ran out of things to say and just coming up with more and more ideas for the podcast. So this is just great. And, and, uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Um, gosh, everybody's been reaching out and helping me get ideas for the podcast and, and uh, telling me how much they like it, and, and nice to see the the numbers keep climbing. It seems like guys just keep finding the podcast and keep liking it. So, man, I'm just thrilled. This is um, this is a great deal for me. So, um, today on the podcast, I want to talk about. Uh, I, I just want to kind of have a free flowing podcast and talk about this hunt I just did with my dad. I teamed up with him, and we went and did a little backpacking trip and. And, uh, you know, I know it's, it's kind of the same as I had last weekend, only this time, you know, my dad bought a, a, brought a rifle instead of a bow and we were able to team up and look for a mature buck from him for him. But, you know, I, I picked up on a few things on these hunts, um, that just that I wanted to share with you guys, some great information on, on planning out your hunts and planning out your day while you're hunting. And, and, uh, I've got, some, I've also got some questions on, on how I hunt, how long I sit on a vantage point or, you know, when I decide to move. And so, you know, as I, as I tell this story about my dad's hunt, you know, we'll kind of get into a few things and then I just want to get into, you know, how I plan out my hunts and how I hunt effectively, you know, on public lands and in different places from, from mountains to coulee country, you know, something where we can apply it on all of our hunts. And, and so I wanted to go over that and then, and then also, um, I see all these new bows coming out. Hoyt has released their 2017 line, and and Matthews has a, a released their new 2017 line. And so guys are starting to think about getting new bows. And so I want to talk to you guys about uh, bow setup. So I'm not sure how long the podcast will go, and if I can fit bow setup in, and and how I set up my bow start to finish. But I think it's great information. So hopefully I can get it out. You know, in this podcast. If not, we'll we'll have to do another episode. And, and talk about it there and I, and I might have to get into to some of the more details on a, on another episode but um, it's gonna be a little techy as I get into my bow setup and why I do what I do but it seems like all you guys are, are knowledgeable hunters out there are knowledgeable bow hunters and everybody's looking to take their hunting to the next level so you know I'm not afraid to put it out there you know bore you guys to death with uh, technical jargon and setup on bows because I think you guys can all keep with me and and learn how to make those adjustments and learn how to work on your bow and it's it's one of those things where um, you know guys kind of treat it like a black magic working with their bows you know and the, take it into the shop which the shop guys are fine but nobody puts the care into setting up your bow like you do and and even if you still have a shop guy help you out and you just kind of learn what's going on and what they're doing and the adjustments you can make to to create better accuracy with your bow that that knowledge is powerful and that knowledge and knowing how to adjust and move things and what's going on with your bow is going to make you going to make you better in the long run um so i i want to talk about my bow setup and how i set up my bows and and hopefully you guys will get some tips for that but um so i'll start off um, I teamed up with my dad this weekend, which is just great. Um, my dad's still a young guy and still just goes for it. He's, he keeps himself in good shape. I think he's he's 20 years older than me. I think he's 56 or somewhere right in there. And, and always kept himself in good good shape and eats right and just loves to hunt. And uh, so so I really like teaming up with him and, and being able to go. And, and, you know, he got me hunting at a young age and and he'd, he'd pick me up, you know, every weekend we'd, we'd be going out and going out hunting. And, and at that point it was Washington hunting blacktails or elk. And we, we beat a lot of brush. We, um, it is thick there, Western Washington, you know, it's all underbrush and, and heavy trees. And, and the, the only way we knew how to hunt was, was to, to beat brush, to go cover country and, and cover, you know, and, we maybe didn't think about bedding and feeding and, and didn't, you know, 
the, the knowledge just wasn't out there to where, you know, we just knew you'd, you walk around, you look for sign and you look for deer and try to catch up to them, you know, and didn't do a lot of glassing in the clear cuts, which I think I would do more of now. I mean, there's definitely things I would change, but I, I wouldn't change anything about my childhood and the hunting experiences I had and, and, and being successful at a young age and just spending that time with my dad, having him show me different uh, tricks and tips and tactics and, and then just spend the time with me, be able to get away for a weekend and we did backpacking trips back into the high country for black tails and and all this wild stuff as a kid that just blew my mind which which i mean uh created the fire and created the passion that i have now for hunting so you know i just can't thank him enough for for introducing that to me so now in today's day and age we're in the new age of hunting where uh you know i've just immersed myself into it you know i i moved to montana and then my dad moved to montana not not too long after me and then, you know, a lot of my family has moved over here and, and, and we just moved over for better opportunity, you know, in the outdoors. I, I love to fly fish and, and then, of course, hunting was my passion. And, and I just wanted more opportunity. The seasons were so short in Washington and, um, you know, they've they've got some some different treaties there and just some different different problems with game management there. And there just isn't as much game and there's a lot of people and, you know, and it's not Western game where you I mean, it's Western game, but it's not the huge giant mule deer you dream of or or the the great big Rocky Mountain elk, the big six points or antelope or bear. And, and they do have some opportunity and some good hunting there and you can travel. But but that's what I was looking for as, as I you know, got on and, and got a job. I didn't have a family. I didn't have anything holding me down there. I didn't have, you know, a wife and kids or whatever. So for me, it was just the perfect chance to, to pick the place I wanted to live in the country and then, and then go make a living there and be able to immerse myself in hunting. So we're in this new age of hunting that I've just immersed myself in and got all this experience. And, and just like you guys, I was trying to gain as much information as I could. And so when I got to Montana, I mean, I was, I was reading magazines and reading articles and, uh, you know, didn't have podcasts back then, but, uh, if anybody was talking hunting, hunting shows, I, I was into it, you know, anybody in the, in the town I could talk to about hunting, about elk hunting. And I, I just learned as much as I could. And I started off both rifle and bow hunting and, uh, really enjoyed rifle hunting, um, uh, hunting for trophies. And then, and then I've always just had this love for bow hunting and, and uh, so just through the years of gaining experience and then, you know, starting to travel to different states, I, I've gathered all this knowledge to where, um, you know, I got a pretty good skill set in, in the Western woods. And so to be able to take my dad and, and kind of share more information and share just like epically good spots with him, you know, where you, where there's just deer running everywhere, uh, see, see him light up and just have so much fun. You know, that's, uh, it means a ton to me. So, so anyways, I, I hadn't hunted with dad all year long, which, um, you know, we'd just been busy with, with work and different things and, and it hasn't lined up and, you know, and he always supports me in, in filming and then these adventure hunts. And he used to backpack quite a bit with me, um, into the wilderness and, and anymore, you know, I, I just don't know that he likes pushing quite that hard. He, you know, not that he, he likes to hunt hard and he likes to go hard, but living out of a backpack off granola doing 15 miles a day, you know, isn't all, is, isn't a ton of fun for him anymore. And so, um, we try to do these not easier hunts, but, but they are, they're easier hunts than, than backpacking to 13,000 feet in Colorado. And we, we try to do out of state hunts and we try to do in state hunts, but, but anyways, we hadn't had much of a chance to hunt this season and, um, elk season didn't, didn't work out, you know, with a bow, um, he had stuff going on. And so, um, anyways, this is the first chance that we've got to hunt together this season. And so, we just teamed up, me and him, and I just told him about this spot, the spot where I killed my buck last weekend, and said, yeah, I mean, uh, this spot is pretty epic. There's there's bucks running around and mature bucks running around like you like to shoot, so let's let's load up the backpacks and we'll go light and go in there and see if we can't bust you a buck. And, and uh, like I've told you guys before, I'm just down to weekends only. I can hardly even get a Friday off. Just I've taken so much time and I've got all these responsibilities at work and and uh, just what it is this season and so we uh, me and Dad went and oh gosh I uh, finished a floor on Friday and um, had to do a few things and we didn't get out of here till the afternoon late afternoon after work and and so we headed out there and 
got out there and and then backpacked into this spot that I had that was pretty good and and uh, to see him light up I mean we just started seeing bucks everywhere and so um we we started glass and we glassed this first drainage that was really good to me last weekend and there wasn't I don't even think we saw a buck in there and so instantly we're on the move with our packs and just trying to find new area and we found a a pretty good four point we were just walking kind of the border we were maybe a quarter mile in this um, public land and so we're walking the border of private public um, way back into this land that then opens up into more country and gosh we see a nice four point on the ridge and he's a good buck I mean he's 24 26 probably like a four and a half could be a five and a half year old buck and and uh, so instantly it's game on you know and he's with does he doesn't see us we kind of cat and mouse and I'm sure he's on public where we first see him and we're about 300 yards and trying to get a decent setup and it just doesn't pan out and then he kind of comes across and towards us to a couple hundred yards but then he's coming right towards the border and so yeah, I had to make the call you know dad says is he on public and I, I said uh, you know I don't I don't know don't shoot you know and I just wasn't sure I could see on my GPS where where private was but we were on the line or we were on the border and so I didn't want to make the mistake and have him shoot that buck in the wrong area so we had to hold off that buck as he traveled through and found out you know just a little bit later I walked up to where the buck was and he was completely on public we could have shot him but no big deal it was you know it's just a it was a cool encounter and we were happy to get it and and uh, so then we just um, proceeded to go down and hunt this area Oh, caught another good buck that came over the ridge, chased a doe over the ridge. I didn't think he could get away from us. Um, the way he worked into this drainage below us, we set up like to, to get a shot, and he was a big old mature. It was an older deer, but um, you know it, it wasn't going to score the best or anything. But he was a heavy five-year-old deer, one we wanted to shoot, and he came over the hill and disappeared. And then we thought he'd appear right below us. Um, and then I could see the opposing hillside. So I kind of thought like he can't get away from us, but I don't know what that buck did. If he doubled back or he never came through our opening, we rolled up to the next ridge. So see if he was stopped in there, bedded in there. He was chasing a doe just right on her tail. I think it was a doe and a fawn or something. And, and, uh, so look for that buck. Couldn't find him. Um, man, I don't know where he went. So we made this game plan to cross another drainage and get on the opposite side and kind of glass back and got on the other side. And it's starting to get middle of the day now. And we had picked out a few more deer here and there and maybe a couple smaller bucks or something like that and got on the opposing hillside and, and uh, started glassing a bunch of bedding spots for these deer, um, knowing that they'd be put away or close to put away and, and started picking out more bucks. We saw Oh, like two different three points on a couple different features, but they were just those younger deer, those three and a half year old deer, uh, nothing we were interested in shooting. And so we just kept rolling country with our packs and grabbing different vantage points and grabbing those vantage points in the middle of the day. I'll get into this more when we talk about hunt planning, but you know, as we get into the heat of the day, a lot of guys are are calling it quits, waiting for evening, and and um, you know, and sometimes you you got to do that and play your best evening in evening. You don't want to bumble through country and just um, spook stuff and blow stuff up when you don't have a good opportunity walking through. But we kind of had a really good game plan to look over these betting spots of these deer, and they were betting on these north sides or you know kind of the shaded sides of these hillsides which most of the time are northeast northwest north and then there'd be a timber patches you know timber patches always grow on these north sides and then it's it's a little bit more open on the south sides and then there's been a big burn come through a couple of years ago and so that burn had had burned a lot of those trees but those deer still felt secure in those spots and and uh, so we were glassing the bedding timber and picking out deer all day long i mean i think I think the end of the first day, we saw something like 12 or 13 different bucks and probably 30, 40 does or something and um, picked out some good bucks here and there. And like I say, those couple mature ones we saw, we just couldn't close the deal. And then we were seeing a lot of the mediocre bucks and not mediocre, just younger bucks. And we're looking for the older ones. And so we just kept moving and kept glassing and kept moving and kept glassing 
geez, all day long. I mean, um, I didn't have my pedometer on. My my battery was low on my phone, and so I didn't have my pedometer on, but I'm sure we did. Oh, man, had to do 12 to 15 miles with our packs on all day. Um, just crazy miles. You know, not a ton of elevation, but, you know, enough up and down to work you, you know. And, and Dad just did great, and he was having a blast. We were just seeing a bunch of deer, and then finally, gosh, we picked out a, a good buck, with like an hour left of light and he was bedded and uh, just a stud of a buck just a, a four point definitely five and a half or older super heavy horned and, and these deer you know that were hunting out eastern montana they um you know you don't you don't catch a lot of 200 inch bucks and you you will see you know 180 inch deer out there but a lot of these big deer um you know i don't know if they don't have the genetics or they you know maybe they don't have the I, they had the age. I mean, they get big, heavy horns like you want on mule deer, but they just don't score the best. And it's got to be the genetics have been shot out, or the. And Montana lets us hunt during the rut, which is a really cool experience, but it's also the Achilles heel for mule deer. Um, and especially, you know, rut with a rifle. And so I think a lot of these genetics have been shot out over the years, or. You know, I, I don't know what to think on it, but they're just not as many big deer as other places that manage um, both for age and genetics, you know, places like uh, Wyoming and, and uh, Colorado and and Utah. And, and these places don't allow these rut hunts or don't allow very many of them. I know Colorado has a four season rifle season, but they really control the numbers where Montana just lets all the residents and then the non-residents that put in go for it. But but anyway, so this was a good buck, you know, sure he wasn't going to be 210 or anything, but he was a big, heavy, five and a half or older buck, just super tall, great back forks, good front forks, the buck we're looking for. And so he's just bedded there, and so we kind of make a plan, and it's like, man, is he going to stay bedded or get up and feed, or what's he going to do? And and uh, so we made a play for him on his bed, thinking we could get to him before he got up, and so down the coulee we went, kind of making, making good pace on him, and got down there and and dad drops his drops his pack and i bring my pack and so he can get a rest off of it and we roll up to where the buck's going to be bedded and kind of slow down and roll over the hill and he's gone and uh, then i see a couple deer pile out in the coulee back there and i said man I, th I think he went back there got up to feed and so we we made another play and and dropped down in the coulee good wind you know thermals are coming downhill it's just perfect and uh, so we sneak up and get up there and get get dad in range and gosh this all of a sudden we're 170 yards and we've got him laid down over the pack on a little hillside just looking at his dream buck you know a great big one and and uh oh man so dad airballed that buck from 170 yards totally missed it he thought he hit it he thought it went down in the ditch and dropped and then i see the buck come right back up rutting a doe um I don't know what he did. He's a, such a good shot with his rifle, and I'm used to him being automatic with it. But, you know, this year we've been so busy, he hasn't practiced with his rifle much, and, and uh, hasn't. I don't think he shot a round out of it um, since we killed a, a nice four-point last year. And and uh, and he knows that too, but, you know, usually he's a pretty good shot and pretty stable. You know, I don't... I. I think it was maybe that case of, you know, getting the crosshairs on that buck, and he was chasing a doe you know, almost like he's going to go out of range or go out of sight. And so maybe he just got a little hurried on his shot and, and punched that trigger on his rifle and then missed that buck. Um, I think he shot low the first time. I thought the dirt came up behind the buck like he had shot through the buck and the dirt came up, but that buck came up and he was clean and didn't have any shots there. He was still rutting a doe even after the rifle shot or whatever. It's just how little pressure they have back there. And and then uh, dad ended up missing again. Um, uh, the buck ran up the hill and, you know, I think it was just a case of buck stopped. He waited for a good shot and, and missed that buck again. And, oh, man, he was just beside himself. Um, it, he loves to hunt and he's always got a good mood on him, but he was really down. He missed that buck and, and uh, buck went over the hill. And, and there's nothing you can really say. And, and we, all, we all miss. Um, gosh, with a, with a rifle you know just like he just said you just can't miss box like that he was he was just beside himself he was so upset and i thought gosh dad we might have to check your rifle and he was pretty sure it wasn't the rifle and um rifles always shot on and always been dead on and 
he was good left or right. He just um, he hit low and and then I think he he missed low again. Um, I thought it was the the rifle or something because I haven't seen him you know miss here for quite a while. But um, it just it just happens and we kind of talked it over and I think he punched his trigger and got a little excited or rushed his shot. But um, anyways, he was just beside himself and so we made camp for the night. Um, slept there and uh, gosh they're just long nights too you just got way too much time to think about your miss too you know it gets dark at five o'clock or five thirty, and then you know you got to stay up till nine or ten we didn't have a fire or anything and um you know we're just pretty much sitting out there talking and you know the only thing he has to think about is that miss and so we go over it and over it and he said he even woke up a couple times in the middle of the night you know thinking about that miss or whatever and so anyways, we, we, you know, I just tell dad, nothing you can do. You can't have it back. You know, we, we all miss and I miss this season with my bow and, you know, and I, I prepare tirelessly, uh, tirelessly, is that even a word? Um, I, I, I prepare nonstop with my bow so I can make all these, these shots and, and then, you know, I can miss, you know, we can all miss, we all miss. If you hunt long enough, you miss. It's just the way it is. And you try to minimize that, but, um, you know, you just, you can't eliminate it. It's, it happens now and again, and, and it happened to him. And so, um, you know, we try to get over it and then in the morning and just tell him, you know, we got to go look for that buck and see, you know, here's three or four different options where we can go look for that buck. And so we grab a master vantage point in the morning and start picking out bucks in the morning and a couple smaller bucks. And then, and then I see this big, heavy, mature deer, just a huge body on him. And he's by himself. He's searching for does and uh, he's kind of cruising. I said, Dad, I, and it was just that, that morning light where I had a little wind shake in my scope and, and not really good light. And I couldn't tell him exactly what the buck was. I said, I don't know what he is, Dad, but he's a big, heavy, older deer. All I could see was dark horns and a big body. And I think Dad wanted redemption pretty bad. And, and, and we've only got the, the weekend to hunt. Season's closing in here. And not that he's going to take a buck that he's, he's not happy with, but I think he wanted to kill a deer pretty bad. And so, um, he, he didn't even look at the deer through the scope. He just trusted what I said, you know, and I said, well, he's, he's a pretty good mature buck. And he said, well, let's drop down and get a better look at him. And so we kind of drop down and go to cut off this deer and get down there and then I see this deer coming up the draw and he he picked our you know he's going to be on the opposing hillside of us and so we get dad set up at 250 yards and I've got him in the scope and and deer have this tendency when they're going to cross over a ridge or they can see new area they stop and really stare at that direction I knew that deer didn't see us or didn't wind us but he kept looking our way well dad he's he's right at the base of those of those trees right there you know there were some red trees or whatever and and uh, dad just couldn't see him over the grass line or whatever. Yeah, excuse me. And um, so I, I just uh, I kept saying, hey, he's right at the base of the trees. And, and dad couldn't get on him or couldn't see him. And so I said, just wait, just be still. He'll come out. And I had the buck in the scope and then could see what he was. And God, he was just a freak of a deer. He was he was only a three on his one side, but a huge, heavy, dark horn, wide three, just big one, you know, uh, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for bigger, older deer. I mean, dad's not looking to throw one in the record books. He's just looking to kill big, heavy, dark, you know, big, heavy, mature deer. And, and he had a big three on his one side, and then he had this this huge spike, looked like an elk spike on the other side with a couple weird eye guards coming off of it. And, uh, so I kind of told dad what he was and, and dad said, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot him. And I said, Oh, okay. Yeah, here we go. And so I ranged that buck at 250 yards as he kind of came out the base of those trees and that wide open. And then dad found his redemption buck, made a perfect shot and dumped that buck right there. So it was, uh, uh, good for him. It was so cool to see him be successful and then help him pack it out of there and just have epic hunting. And like I say, it was a quick trip. You only get a day and a half to hunt, but but cool to see him have success like that and be with him. And so he was pumped, felt way better. You know, it always feels better. Uh, you feel better about the miss after you can succeed and, and kill a nice buck. So that was pretty cool and pack that thing out of there and closed up our weekend. So um, yeah, it just means so much to me to be able to share these hunts with family. And I just got to make it a priority every season, whether it's my kids or my wife or my dad or my uncles or my cousins or whatever it is, is is just share this knowledge that I've gained and try to take them to the best spots I can and, and give them a 
good encounters and good experiences in the woods and you know the same things they did for me when I was a kid you know at least my my uncles and my dad and um, grandpa and things like that so uh, pretty cool to be able to share that with them but um, and I thought I'd, I had guys asking me about you know how I go about my hunts and in every hunt and every way you go about it is a little bit different and I mean it's different by like people ask well how long do you sit on the vantage point and for me it just depends, you know, if, um, it, if I'm seeing deer from the vantage point and I feel like I'm in the best spot possible and there's no other spot to move to get a better viewpoint, you know, I'll sit there all morning, you know, and, but if I'm, if I'm sitting on the vantage point and I'm not seeing what I'm looking for, you know, I, I may only spend 15, 20 minutes there. I may spend five minutes there and move on. So hunting is such a feeling and such a instinct. So where do I go next or what's my next move? And so I'm always trying to think of my next move, but uh, so it, it's tough to say how long I'll sit on a spot. Um, like this last spot me and dad found on the vantage point, we were looking over the huge drainage. We were in the money spot, and even if I didn't see that shooter buck, we were going to sit on that vantage point, and we were going to look there the majority of the morning. You know, I was going to sit there just because it was the best view of the whole canyon that we had, and if anything moved in there, any rutting deer, any deer putting away, we were going to see it. Um, but you, you only have this, this window of morning and evening where these deer are really moving through feeding features. Um, so you, you want to really focus on the feeding features in the mornings and the evenings and, and, you know, more open features, um, and you want to look for vantage points with just absolutely commanding views of as, as much country as you can see. And, and then, you know, your, your morning window for time for animals moving. I mean, usually you get, you know, a couple, two to three hours. Of course, the first hour is the best movement you're going to see. That's when those animals are out in the open and they're moved, but they, they move for two, three hours, usually in the morning, you know, and that's the same for, you know, if it's August, September, you know, or if it's November, you get a couple hours of movement two, three hours out of movement out of these animals. And so you want to really use your good vantage points, but you want to use your instincts and just feel it out. And like the first day we stopped in this epic good vantage point where we had this commanding view where I had seen five or six bucks the weekend before, but we got to this vantage point, um, me and dad did in the morning or whatever. And this was the first place we stopped and we started glassing around and I picked out a few does down below, a couple does up above, but it just wasn't happening. I could I could tell there just wasn't much movement in there and for the first hour to not see what I was looking for in that drainage. It's like, man, let's use this morning light and let's go. We got to go to the next drainage. We got to go. We got to try to get to the next drainage before morning's over so we can, you know, maybe pick out an animal. And so it's just a feel on these vantage points for for how long you sit. There is no said time you sit. Um, it, it just depends on the, on the game animals you see and the movement you're seeing and, um, and, and then, you know, what you have as an option to move to. And we had another drainage to move to, but it was going to take us at least an hour to get there. But that hour to get there, we were able to look on the way and then spot that nice four point on the way that, that dad about shot that was on that, that private public line. Um, so you, you use those morning hours to, to look from good vantage points, but you just don't be afraid to move and, and move ridge lines or try to get a different vantage point or look over something different in the morning, a, a different little piece of the drainage or um, like this big drainage we're in, it's got a bunch of micro drainages that go down on the same side and they're a mile and a half long and they make a big bold basin with a ridge on either side. And so we've got all these options to look down in each bold basin and make sure there's not a buck in each one of those in the morning light when they're moving. Now, you know, you can you can be the um, in the best spot in the world, but if you're there at the wrong time of day, like like this big drainage, you know, that we saw 16 or something, 17 bucks over the weekend or something like that. But if you go look at this drainage in the middle of the day and go look at all these features and all these feeding features, um, you may not see a deer in there. It's all about looking at the right times in the right places. So 
you know, get those good vantage points and those commanding views, but then don't be afraid to check out new country in that morning or in the evening. You know, I, I'll, I'll get on a vantage point. Um, like this time we used the evening, we just used a mobile vantage point. We were on a big ridge line with a big drainage to our left and a big drainage to our right. And as it got evening, you know, our best play was to work down this ridge line and then we'd walk out to different vantage points and we'd sit out there for five, 10 minutes, glass around, see what there was to see, and then get Get back on the main ridge line and keep working down and then get to a vantage point on the right side and every little spot that would go out you know and give us a good view we'd look at but we just kind of kept on the move and kept looking and that's what worked best for for this piece of country and and a lot of times elk hunting that's what i do um you know I'll, I'll if i don't see what i'm what i'm after from the master vantage point i just keep working i keep working these ridge lines i go look in the next bowl i go look in the next basin and and it's important to not move the the whole time as well. You know, what do I mean by that? Not me- move the whole time. What I mean is you, as you're as you're hiking and looking, you need to make sure that you're taking time to look after, look off these different points. And if you get a good view, you you need to sit down for five minutes. It's amazing when you sit down and you look and you just take a second and take a break. You know, you'll see deer, you'll see elk. And I think me and Dad, we saw deer from every vantage point we stopped at. But if you just keep walking and throw up your quick binos for 10, 15 seconds, there's no guarantee you're going to see everything. So, you know, you want to move, but you want to be able to stop and kind of glass around, you know, at every every good vantage point or every good look of country you see. And then, you know, you've also got to be aware as you're moving through country. And we did really good this weekend. I don't know that we spooked a deer other than that deer dad, dad missed. Um, but as you're moving through country, you know, keep your head on a swivel. You know, you want to be looking around constantly. You do not want to surprise those deer and have those deer see you before you see them. So anytime you're exposing yourself to a new piece of country, don't just walk out into the wide open to glass it, you know, start glassing it as you're walking up to it, glassing and making sure there's no deer out that are in the open that are going to see approaching. And, and so you really want to have your head on a swivel and be, be hunting through country. And, and it doesn't mean you have to be tiptoeing through country, but you don't want to be bull rushing through country. Um, so as you work through country, you know, you, you just take your time, you, you glass everywhere you can glass, you, you're looking with your eyes, you know, you're not looking at your feet, you're walking with your head up and then getting to all these different vantage points and looking off. And then, um, you know, in the, in the middle of the day, like I say, if you can be in the best place in the world, but in the middle of the day, you're not going to see anything. And so it's important in these middle of the day hours, um, you know, and you don't want to wear yourself out. And, and I don't like going through like bedding timber and things. I don't like just walking aimlessly through country because what I end up doing is I end up blowing up deer, blowing up elk, and I end up blowing them out of the country and not getting a chance at them. That's just, I mean, 99 out of a hundred times. That's what happens. I mean, every once in a while you'll see one it before it sees you walking through timber or thick cover or where they like to bed. But man, I just don't like hunting that way. I like seeing them first, um, and getting the upper hand on them. And so through the middle of the day, I won't go walk through where I think those animals are. What I will do is I will try to get a, a vantage point. And when I, when I'm hunting, I, I just constantly want to see my, my quarry. I want to, I want to see the animals I'm hunting. And if, if I can see them, I can kill them. If I can relocate them, I can I can kill them. If I can get closer and see them, I can kill them. But it's all about knowing where they're at, and knowing where to slow down, and know knowing where those animals you know are hanging out, so you can sneak up on that area. And so, um, gosh, I lost my place there. Um, I <laughs> I think that's gonna happen with me as I drift in and out. But um, anyways, you 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 just um you don't want to blow up these animals as you're as you're walking through the timber you want to know where they're at so oh that's where I was at as I was talking about finding vantage points where you can see them and not walking through the good bedding timber and so a lot of times 
Um, you know, if I, if I see an animal, I won't just take chase after it. What I'll do is I'll try to get to where I can see that animal. So if an animal's working up a draw, you know, I won't go up the same side as them. I'll cut across the draw and get on the opposing hillside. So then I can keep an eye on them and then kind of work back with them. And then hopefully I can see where he's going to bed at or where he's going to hang out at, where he's going to slow down and feed. And then I can make my play or if I know where he's at and have to make a play on him in the afternoon or the evening, you know, that's what I do. But um, I'm always trying to keep an eye on these animals instead of walk through aimlessly. So in the middle of the day, um, you know, I'll grab vantage points and I'll look, but I'm not grabbing the same vantage points that I would grab, say, in the morning or the evening. I mean, sometimes for high country mule deer, they'll just bed in a in a patch of four or five trees or under a couple trees or on a cliff band, and they don't always have to be in north side timber, you know, when you're hunting high country muleys. So a lot of times you can get good vantage points for high country muleys that you'd be using in morning and evening. It's just, you know, you kind of get to new country and then set up in glass but as far as elk and and late season muleys and and mid season muleys you really want to get to where you can look at like this north side timber or uh, northeast timber northwest timber you want to look where the cover is look where these deer bed down or these elk bed down and they're gonna bed down on the on the shady cool sides of these hillsides or you know in the bottoms of draws or you know just try to think like an animal and where you would bed down at and then get the right angle on that country get the the right opposing hillside or the right vantage point that looks it over and and that's what we did this weekend as we were looking in this north side burned timber and every place we looked in the middle of the day there was deer in there and and deer and elk they they get up throughout the day they don't bed down and bed down for eight hours solid and then get up in the evening the deal is is they just kind of get up and they feed around and, and work around you know that that bedding cover that they're in and they'll get up and rut around and you know chase their cows or chase their does and and the does and the cows they'll get up and they'll feed around in the timber and feed on some grasses here or there they might even come out in a little opening and feed a little bit and so animals are moving throughout the day they just take a nap and then they'll they'll get up again and and, and they're not committed to that bed for the entire day i mean if you see them bed down you can count on you know an hour two hours something like that but after that they're going to readjust and get up and feed a little bit and then bed down again and you know they might bed down for for three hours but but they're not going to bed all day and so when they're up and moving you can see them and And when you're, when you're, so I try to get these vantage points and I try to kind of plan it out where I'm looking at, at bedding spots throughout the middle of the day. Um, and when I'm glassing bedding spots, bedded, bedded deer are a lot tougher to spot than, than feeding deer. And so you take more time, you get to a, a good vantage point where you can see the bedding timber and now there's no rush. It's not like morning where you've got a two hour window where animals are moving and, and you're kind of looking for an animal being up and feeding instead of being bedding. And so you don't, you don't have to look as hard. Sure. You want to pan good with your binos, but you don't have to dissect every tree in, in every little spot where for the bedding timber in the middle of the day, you really do. You want to just dissect that stuff and dissect it with your binos. And then, and then I always carry a scope with me when I'm, when I'm deer hunting and, and, uh, so then I'll, I'll pull out my scope and get my tripod and pick it out. And, and we were able to spot, deer all day long in these bedding spots and we just kind of keyed into this north side burnt timber and it was just like where are we going to walk to see the next spot and we'd spot a buck in there and you know maybe it was a three-year-old or you know maybe it was just a bunch of does or, or who knows but and then we'd move on and and think about the next spot we'd go and go back there and we'd we'd spot deer back in there um so it's so important to have a good game plan and be looking at the right spots in the in the right time of day when when you're planning your hunt, um, just to make sure you can keep into animals. Um, so, anyways, I just I picked up some good tips. You know, I, I it just makes me think about things more when I'm on these hunts and when I'm hunting with dad and we're seeing all these bucks in this north side timber. It just reminds me, you know, that gosh, you you gotta 
you got to be looking in that stuff and and same with with elk season this year just looking in the spots where they bed you know during the middle of the day and able to pick out elk bedded in in different spots and so key into this when when you're hunting around the hills and when you're making your game plan for your hunts you know just be looking at the the right spots at the at the right times and and see if you can't pick these things out and get them get a chance at them um so yeah it's just um see if i have anything else to to add off that hunt planning you know i was trying to think about high country deer too and what they do and i i really want to get into a a high country episodes i just love hunting high country mule deer and i can't wait for next year i'm gonna i'm gonna try to hunt at least a couple states high country and and go try to find these bucks that uh, i just love that time of year and chasing these things and they have a little bit more lax attitude in that high country this time of, that time of year um so that's where you can use those those vantage points um but gosh i i hunt almost exclusively vantage points and a lot less walking around for high country mule deer i mean i do a lot of hiking to get to the next vantage point or the next spot but once i find a good spot to glass from you know i'll sit there and and pan around and see if i can pick those things out um and then i'll then i'll cover country that'll unlock another basin or another bowl or whatever it is but um yeah, it's an exciting time of the season. I know hunting season's winding down, but this is where I get amped up to start working hard again for next year and start planning my hunts and where I'm going to put in for my permits and, and how I'm going to do that. So um, a super fun time of the year um, to, to start thinking about next season. I still got one hunt left in New Mexico, so um, yeah, I'm going to work hard. God, I really want to kill a mature buck down there. I, I've, I've got some nice animals this year and really happy with my season, but um even if i have to eat my tag down there i'm gonna look for a big heavy one and and uh look for a big heavy older deer yeah that deer of dads we so they we went by the got them all packed out of there and then went by the check station and those guys are really good at aging deer in there and they say too you know once the deer gets over five and a half you know they're kind of guessing at it but yeah this was one of the older bucks they had checked that big spike horn unicorn thing dad shot um so we were just pumped big heavy deer and then the 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 guy that checked it in there said yeah this buck is at least five and a half probably i think he wrote down six and a half on his board is what he thought that buck was um but he said it could even be older than that so six and a half year old deer in a general season high pressure unit i mean that's so cool to be able to find and unlock these spots that are that are really good hunting in there so yeah i felt good to be able to share that and dad felt good you know to be able to kill an older buck like that so those are just the ones i like to hunt um so anyways we're gosh i made it i i babbled on for 42 minutes about uh different spots in that but i do really want to get into this bow setup so let's see the last couple podcasts i've done have been about an hour let's see if i can i can kind of um talk about this and get it all fit in here to about 20 minutes on the bow setup because i think this time of year is super important for guys so i kind of jump all over the map we go from hunting tactics to dad's hunt to then bow setup but you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the style of what I do. Just, um, get on here and talk hunting and talk about, um, uh, things I'm thinking about. And, and I think that bow, the, the bow setup is so important, you know, they, so, you know, setting up your own bow, it, it, it's just learning about your own bow. It just, it just makes you so much better knowing how to tweak and tune things. And so, you know, I started setting my own bows up from scratch and I'd been doing it uh, maybe 10 years or so. And, and I just started paying attention to the shop and asking questions. And then, and then I had a good buddy that, that set up his own bows. And, and so he really helped me out walking me through the process too, and teaching me what he knows and sharing information. And so, you know, sometimes if you can get a get a buddy or a mentor that's a little bit better at you at working at bows, or even just the the shop guy and ask questions and what he's doing and how he's doing it. But um, with these new bows coming up, I love setting bows up from scratch. I just love getting them shooting as good as I can make them shoot. And so I was just gonna start at the beginning here. And um, so I, I get my bow. First thing I do is. is um, screw the rest to it and, and, and screw the sight to it. And, and I've got this own, my own way of setting up my sights. And I use the black gold ascent, which is just an awesome sight. Uh, I probably take it as a step further than most guys do, but 
on a dial site, um, you know, where you dial, and I've talked about it before, and you guys know what a, a, a dial site is, but um, it's so it's so important that this site keeps level on there. So when you dial your site, it dials level down, and so you don't have left or right misses as you dial down. So your axes on your bow being level are so important. And so when I start out with my site, this is what I do. I, I level my bow. So I stick a level and a door jam or whatever it is, and then I stick, you know, both sides of my limb pockets on that level, and I make sure my my bow is completely level. Then what I do is I take my sight and and the the sidebar on my sight. Um, let's see what it it'd be like. Um, you know, on the black gold, there's adjustment to to set it up, and what you're doing is you're making sure that this axis on your sight is level while your bow is level. And so what I do is I level my bow, and then I stick a level on my my sight bar on the side of my sight, and I make sure that's level. So now my bow's level, my sight's level, and now what I do is I take the level inside my bow or inside my sight. So, you know, all these sights nowadays have a level which is so important for your left or right shots. So now I've got my bow level, my sight level. Now I move that little level in my in my in my sight and I move that level. So, you know, I'm checking all three of those planes to make sure that every time I'm holding my bow level, my sights level, and my bubble inside my sight is level. And so it's just a check I do to make sure that everything's set up right. And and uh, so I, I get get my rest on, I get my sight on. Um, you know, I, I, I try to, I put my, my peep sight in, or I, uh, um, so when you set your sight, so what I do is, um, the burger button is, is the little hole on the side of your bow. And most bows are set up to be, so you're up and down, your arrow wants to go right through the center of that burger button hole. And so, um, I set my sight up and down to where that arrow is going through the burger button hole. And then I just kind of make sure my arrow is square to my string in my, my, arrow is level coming off my string. Now, that's how I set it up and how I tie it in. And then you can make little adjustments with your rest after we start paper tuning. But um, so I, I set my rest so it goes through the center of the burger buttonhole and then I tie in my knock. And when I'm tying a string loop on my bow, I don't like to tie my string loop right around the knock. It's too tight in there where then when you draw back, it can actually pinch your knock and pull your arrow around a little bit. So what I like to do is I set my my knock where it goes so my arrow's level and then I'm going to tie in my string loop. And what I do is I tie serving above and below my knock and then tie in my string loop right there. And this just makes sure that I don't get any knock pinch in there where it, it pulls my arrow up or down on the release. It's just going to make sure that you got a clean true release so um set up my rest and then i i tie in my uh string loop and then what i do is i measure off my string loop my peep sight i shoot a um a 5 30 seconds peep sight which lines up perfect with my sight aperture and what i do is i usually put that at about five and five eighths and five and five eighths from the center of my knock to the to the center of my peep sight and, and then I don't tie that in. I leave it loose. And what I'm going to do here is then I'm I'm going to draw back my bow and I'm going to do it off of feel. You know, um, every bow with the axle to axle and the way the string angle is is a little bit different. And so what you want is you want tight anchor points. And so if you're shooting a trigger release, you know, you want your thumb in the in the back of your cheekbone. If you're if you're shooting a, a handle release, you know, you want um your, your uh, middle knuckle to line up right on your cheekbone, but whatever your anchor points are, string to the tip of your nose, you know, all these anchor points. But what I, what I do with every bow then is I draw back and I look. And, um, and, and then it changes as I dial. If I dial up to 20 yards, you know, the, the anchor point's really tight. If I dial down to 100 yards, that anchor point gets a little bit looser just from the angle. And so I try to set it up 60 yards and I want a fairly tight anchor point. What I mean by that is you just don't want a lot of slop or play from where your hand anchors to where your, your eye looks through that peep sight. 
And so I kind of play around with my peep sight height right there. And I just, I just want to get it right to where it feels comfortable and feels right. And so I tighten it up to where about as tight as I can shoot comfortably. And like, like I say, for me, it's about five and five eighths or five and a half, uh, from my middle of my string loop to the middle of my peep sight. So that's a good starting point. I still don't tie in my peep sight. I want to be able to move things around and it'll shoot with the peep sight just in there. And also I want to get the string twisted. So you always want to make sure that your that your peep sight is square to it, to you. You don't want it rotating or like every time you shoot, you got to move it with your hand and twist it over. And so now what I'm doing is I'll take my main string and I'll kind of draw back and look through it, draw back and look through it. And I, I want to try to twist my string. And if you twist it off the bottom, so this is your main string I'm talking about. And on the bottom where it loops into your cam, you press your bow and then you twist that string and you, you twist that string, you know, a half a turn or whatever, just to make your peep sight be square to your face every time you draw back. And so I'll kind of adjust this and get it close and it'll, it'll loosen up a little bit or stretch as your string stretch and, and kind of rotate away from you a little bit. And so just knowing this, I'll set it a, a little bit in or just square to my face. And it's something that I can adjust as I go with my setup of my bow. This is just a starting point. So I kind of get that. And, and then what I want to do is I want to get the, the center shot of my arrow just right. And so my rest left and right, I want my, my rest left or right, right in the power path of that string. And so, you know, you can tune on paper and move your rest way outside or way inside, depending on where it tunes. Um, but I like to start with my rest about right in the middle of my grip. And it's usually about seven eighths off the, off the riser right there. And so if you measure off the riser to the center of that, and, and then you can just look down your bow and look at the handle and see if the, see that the rest is in the center of it. Um, so I, I set it up that way. Um, after I got that set, see, I've got my peep in, I've got my string loop, I've got my rest, I've, I've got my sight. You know, now I'm, I'm ready to see how this bow is going to tune. Oh, uh, now it's time to um, time your cams. And so um, if you're shooting a single cam bow, there's no need to time your cams. And that's where you're just shooting a round wheel up top and a cam on the bottom. Um, you'll have a draw stop and every time as you draw back, it'll stop and shoot. There isn't many single cams out there nowadays, but there are a few. Uh, most of you guys will be shooting like the, the slave cam technology. You know, the old technology is, is the double cams and that's where, um, basically you've got a cam up high and then your strings come down and yoke down to the limb. And then you've got a cable down low on, on that, um, on that cam and then that goes up and, and Y yokes into the limb on that. And, and so what you do is you have to tune both of these. So both of those cams come back and stop at the same point. They both stop on the draw stops. And, and you adjust that by putting string, putting twists in or taking twists out to make these cams. So they time. So, um, you'll have a draw stop on both cams that'll hit the string or hit the limb or however the bow's set up. Most of them hit the string and, and you just, you look at them, you have somebody look at them as you draw back. And if one's ahead of the other, then your cams aren't synchronized as they go off and they don't fire that arrow completely right. And, and most cams nowadays are using like the slave cam technology. The Hoyt uses the cam and a half and, and, uh, there's different technologies out there. And what this is, is your bottom cam comes up and Y yokes and hooks to the limb. And then your top cam just goes down and hooks into your bottom cam and they kind of slave together and it's supposed to time your cams. And, and I've even heard people say that there's no need for tuning on these. There is definitely need for tuning on slave cams. They, they work better than a double cam, but they still can get off and they can fire uh, arrows funky. And so same, same premise here. You want these cams firing at the exact same time. And so you got to have somebody help you out. And as you draw back and your draw stops hit the string, you look and if there's distance you know, if say if your top cam is out an eighth inch, well, then then you need to you need to uh, usually you just look at your cams and I look at the engineering of them. It's tough for me to think about right now talking on the podcast which way I adjust which cam. But basically, you've got a bus cable and a control cable. Your control cable is the one that goes um, from your bottom cam to your top cam. Your bus cable is the one that Y yokes that hooks to your bottom cam and. And basically just look at the engineering and look at which way you have to 
change the string to make that cam go go into the stops and so say if your top cam's out an eighth inch or whatever what i'll do is i'll just loosen up that control cable and i'll take a twist out of it so then that so then both of the draw stops are hitting the string at the same time and so you can play around with it and you you adjust one cable and then you draw it back and you look at it again and you go okay well uh, you know now it's even farther out i got to go the other way and then you twist it the other way but you want to get those things just perfectly in time those cams and and uh, so so i work on the my my cam timing before i ever tune my bow or anything and I have somebody help me and then go to your back wall and then just let off your back wall just a little bit. And it's a little tough to do. You got to have really good muscle control, but just let off that back wall a little bit. And then that'll show which, which cam stop is coming off first. And if your cams are totally in time, um, and you want them to hit the string at the same place or their draw stop at the same place and come off at the same time, this will make total synchronized cams. And that's, that's really what you want to, to get your best accuracy. So I time my bow. Um, and, and then I, I go to paper tuning and paper tuning, it's going to show exactly how your arrow is coming out of your bow. So if it comes out with a bullet hole, that's what you want. And, and if it comes out at a bullet hole, it's going to shoot broadheads the exact same as it shoots field points. Um, because your arrow is flying straight out of your bow, it's not going to catch wind on the front end of your bow or anything. So what you're looking for is you're looking for just a bullet hole through paper. So you want to step back. If you step back too far, you know, your arrow has time to correct in flight. Your fletchings will correct your arrow flight. Um, so, you know, not too close, but not too far. Gosh, what is it? About six feet, eight feet away, something like that is where I'll stand. And you just want to shoot through a paper tuner. And, and you can make your own paper tuner too. You don't need a, you know, you can do it with just a sheet of paper and cut a hole out of cardboard and set that in front of your target. Just make sure you set it far enough away to where your arrow has time to go through the paper and then hit the target. And paper tuning is just so important when when tuning your bows and getting them set up because it just shows how your arrow is coming out of your bow. Um, so, so then I go to the paper tuner and I'm trying to tune my bow and and um, you can you can move your rest just little thirty seconds in different directions to correct it. And they have they have graphs on Gold Tip and Easton and different places that you can look. Okay, if my arrow is ripping this way, which way do I move my rest? And you just make small movements to it to to get it to where it tunes right. And and it's important that you have a really good grip and you've worked on your grip so you're right down the lifeline of your bow and you're not torquing your bow. And and what I mean by torquing your bow, your hand makes the one connection to your bow. And, and you want it going down the lifeline and you want pressure in the middle of your hand you don't want too much high grip where you're putting pressure you know with the webbing of your hand and not too much low where you're pushing too hard with your heel right kind of in the middle and then down your lifeline you want to make sure that you're not getting pressure off your pad or pressure off your hand you just want this this neutral spot for your bow to sit where you know because if you if you're pressuring it too much with your heel it makes that bow um, where your bow's torquing and when it goes off then that arrow comes out of there funky and so you really got to make sure you have a good grip before you go to the to the paper tuner and and once you what well, you just want to make sure that you found your grip and know what a good grip is and and work with it because otherwise you just chase your tail in the paper tuner because every time you grip the bow different it rips different and you want consistent rips coming through that paper tuner um, but I go to the paper tuner and I start shooting and, and like I say, there's little graphs and I, you know, I, it takes me a second to remember all the different ways. Okay. If it's, you know, if it's, um, ripping high, I move my rest up. If it's ripping low, I move my rest down. If it's riffing, you know, left, I, I move my, my, you know, you just, you kind of, you can look at these graphs and then it takes me a second to remember all the different ways to move it, but you just move it small increments. And if it starts getting worse, you know, you know, you got to move it back or you went too far and that in the paper tuner can be weird you just got to spend time and and keep gripping the bow right keep shooting arrows and keep adjusting things now some bows you'll find that you just can't tune you can't tune a you know you'll you'll keep moving your rest down you're trying to get this low rip out of it keep moving your rest down and pretty soon you look at your arrow and it's not 90 degrees it's pointing downhill and you don't want that, you know, especially if it's drastic, you want that bow to be coming out or that arrow to be coming out of their level. And so there's different tricks you can use to, you know, to take a low tear out or a high tear out. And I like to use, um, tiller adjustment. And so all tiller adjustment is, is so you've got your, um, 
you've you've got your bolts that hold in your limbs right there and as you loosen those it's less poundage right and so you know most of us shoot our bows all the way up on that and what i'll do is i'll just take that allen wrench on my limbs and i'll take a quarter turn out of it or a half a turn out of it um you know and usually see if it's a low tear i think i gosh i'm trying to remember all this tiller adjustment and um, which way i go and like i say i'm just a lot of self-engineering where i've worked on them so much and i played with them so much and and i'm not scared if i go the wrong way and my problem gets worse i go oh well i, I guess i had to go the other way i tighten back that limb bolt the half a turn and then go to the other one and loosen up that and see what that does and so i'm kind of self-engineering and it's just kind of self-taught i just um you know there's no said book that you run to and go okay which way do i move this or which way do I do this to make it perfect? It's just kind of messing with it. Um, so uh, I, I mess with my if I can't get a low or high tear out, I'll I'll mess with my, um, my with my tiller and, and I'll just adjust. And like I say, I think it's a I think if you got a low tear that won't come out, you can take like you know a quarter half a turn out of your top limb bolt or take you know even up to a full turn if you have to. Just keep seeing if it makes it better and keep going more till you can get that low tear out. Um, and, and it's, you know, just bows are built differently. The way the strings are hooked up, everything's different. And so you have to be, just be willing to mess with it to get the best tune, you know, and each individual has a different grip or a different way they shoot their bow. And so, um, you know, it's just playing around with it and figuring out the best tune for each bow for each person. Um, the, you know, there is no set for everybody. Um, so I'll mess with my tiller adjustment if I can't get the lower high tear out or I don't feel like my arrow is coming out level. And the next thing is your left or right tear. And your left or right tear, um, you know, I like that bow to set up with the rest right in the middle of my of my um, of my handle or of my grip. Um, so as I look at my handle, I want it set up right in the power path of the string because if it's set too far outside, and what I mean by this is is you know, say you're Say you're getting a, a left tear, and so you keep moving your rest outside and outside and outside to get rid of that left tear, which is the correct thing to do, but pretty soon you look at it and your your rest is way out to the outside of your grip. I don't like that. I want it to be right in the center, and so you know I'll move it small increments to the left or the right to try to get a perfect tear, but if it won't tune, then I'll, I'll start moving things around, and one thing you can do is you can mess with your cam lean and that'll bring your tune inside or outside. And so uh, remember we talked about the yoke and the yoke goes up to your top limb and then hooks to your bottom cable. So that yoke, um, it's got a string going to each side of the limb. Well, what you can do is you can adjust your cam lean by putting more twists or less twists into a side of that, and it'll bring your tune inside or outside. So um, usually to bring your tune inside like i say god i'm thinking about this all backwards i'll go back through this podcast and go god damn it i told all those guys the wrong information you actually want to twist this string but like i say you just mess with things and see how it affects the bow and then and and then continue to move it or or move it the other way or whatever but um i think it's to move your tune farther inside you would want to put you know more twists in your outside and less twist in your inside and already they're set up it's a longer distance to the outside um uh, of your of your limb and it's a less distance to the inside of your limb and, and you can kind of look down your string and look down your cam and you can see if your cam's leaning one way or another but usually the the perfect mix for me i can't remember what hoyt says like eight twists on your outside and three twists on your inside or something like that um, but if I want to bring my tune in, I'll put more twists in my outside. So I'll put nine or 10 on my outside and leave three on my inside, or, you know, I'll take a twist out of my inside. And so I'm just messing around with this and you can adjust the way your bow tunes inside or outside by adjusting this cam lean. It's a huge secret to tune in your bow. Um, so I'll mess with this if my tune doesn't quite come out how I want it through the center of the grip. I, I mess with, with my cam lean and I'll mess with that. Now, remember, as you mess with your cam lean and your twisting strings, all of a sudden you've changed the difference uh, you know, of your bus cable, in which 
which changes the distance to your control cable. So now you've got to retime your cams. So every adjustment you make, now you've got to pull back, have somebody look at your cams, and then adjust your control or your bus to make those cams so they're synchronized again. So you got to remember that. So it's it's really a, a pain in the ass. You move one thing, you've moved it all. You change one thing, you've changed everything. But this is part of learning about your bow and, and, and how you can make it shoot right. So... Um, you do that and like um like I told you guys I use that Matthews for um and I, I really like what Matthews did with that. I used the Halon seven for my film tons this year and, and uh you know and I love Hoyts and I've always used Hoyts. Well I got this new Matthews Halon seven or whatever and and um this thing didn't have any Y yokes that went where you could adjust the cam lean. Um both of the cams were tied to each other. And that's just how they slave cam them in. And so there was no cam lean I could do. So when I got this bow and this bow started tuning way outside for me, and I've heard it's the easiest bow to tune. I've heard people say that, but it's it's different for each person. And I'm not going to adjust my grip. I've got a perfect grip that I've used for years that I don't got to think about. And so I adjust the bow to shoot good for me. Um, so when I got this Matthews, it tuned like, I think it, it's either tuned outside or inside. I can't remember which, but but say it turned it tuned way outside for me, and I didn't like it. It didn't go through the center of the grip, but I had no cam lean to adjust this, and so all of a sudden I'm I'm left with this problem of well, hey, now I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to make this bow shoot, and so there was spacers on on the on the washers on either side of the cam, and so. You know, as I started uh, talking to buddies and researching or, you know, I've got a buddy that, that runs a Matthews um, shop in there. And so I just called him and said, hey, it's tuning outside. Like, what can I do? What are my options here? You know, I can't adjust the cam lean. And he said, well, you can you can adjust the spacers on them. And so what I, w- what I would do is, is both of the cams, top and bottom, they have a, a big spacer on the inside and a small spacer on the outside or whatever it was. I think that was the case. And so I was able to take these cams all apart and change my spacers out. And so then I was able to put, you know, the, I was able to put the spacers opposite and create a bigger space on the inside or let's see, a bigger space on the outside, smaller space on the inside. Jesus Christ, you guys are going to be lost with this podcast as I just keep technically talking bows, but I think you guys are keeping with me. I think I'm getting my jargon right through this, but uh, this is a technical podcast and we're over an hour into it. So if you guys are still keeping with me in bow talk, good job. Um, you guys really care about your setup. But anyways, I so I switched the spacers around and when I took the cam apart, you know, took took the um, axle out, switch the spacers. And then as I switched the spacers, it changed the tune of the bow. Now it was able to tune right in the center shot of the bow, right in the power path of the string where I wanted it. So, you know, there's different ways to accomplish it. You just have to be willing to talk to guys, willing to move things around, willing to get it to tune perfectly for you. And, and then after you get it tuned and perfect, then you're able to shoot these, these longer distances with precision and, and shorter distances become easy. And it's just a, a well-tuned uh, bow that's shooting good. And so um, after I get it shooting through paper, I mean, that's where I start shooting groups and sighting in my sights. And um, and, and then I mess with my stabilizers from there. You know, I, I shoot a sidebar and I shoot a front 12-inch stabilizer and I'll, I'll change the weights on those, the, the way the bow reacts. And the, the stabilizers play a huge part in the way you hold. And so you're always looking for a good hold with your stabilizers. But it also changes how the bow reacts after it's shot. And so like if I'm getting – and maybe I've already talked about this. I, I've, I've talked about it and written about it, but I'm just going to say it again here. So – um, I've got a front and a sidebar and say I'm getting a lot of low misses. When I miss, I miss low. So what I'll do is I'll take a weight off my front stabilizer or add a weight to my to my back stabilizer and it makes the bow react different. Now all of a sudden I can take those low misses out of my group. And same thing if I'm missing high, then I'll add a weight to the front of my stabilizer or take one away from the back from my sidebar and now it'll make this bow react different. So now, now I'll just start um, messing with my stabilizer stabilizers you know I want to draw back and be level and have that feel natural and so I'll mess with my sidebar angle on that to see which angle works better work with the weight and I think right now 
I'm shooting a pretty even weight, like maybe five ounces off my front, five ounces off my sidebar, and that seems to be about the perfect mix for me, and then I'll just adjust it a little bit from there, but but now it's just shooting groups and getting used to your bow and, and uh, making it shoot. It's perfectly tuned and timed, and, and everything should be shooting good as you're as your strings wear in, you want to continually twist your string to make sure your peep sight is completely facing out so it's completely open to your eye every time. You don't want to have this deal where you got to twist your, your your peep sight every time. And now, you know, after I get things set, everything's shooting good, I'll tie in my peep sight. And I've got this knot I use where I, I, I do a string wrap up one side around the uh, around the, the peep site and then up the other side and seems to really lock it in place. But, uh, anyways, a lot of technical talk for you guys, but, um, uh, starting from square one, that's how I set up my bows and that's how I get them, um, just shooting darts, um, uh, shooting good groups for me. So, uh, I thought I'd pass that information on and, and, uh, see if you guys can learn from it and maybe learn a couple tricks to, to tuning your bow. So, Okay, well, I've, I've talked way too long on this podcast, and we've covered 10 different subjects, but uh, I think there's some some good tips in there and some good tactics in there for you guys. So um, thanks again for tuning in, and, and thanks for the positive comments, guys. Um, uh, well, uh, till next week, huh? That's the, that's the podcast. So um, thanks again, guys. Talk to you soon.